never say that They don't want to roar so Why do we deny Our own light inside Maybe we were made from stardust So shine Peace and blessings family And welcome to Labors of Love podcast We are here to inspire, uplift, and enlighten Each episode, we will be hearing from Black midwives, doulas, and other traditional childbirth supporters who have dedicated their lives to being of service to Black mothers and families in all aspects of the motherhood journey. This evening, I have the privilege of speaking with Janice Ingram. Janice is a mother of five with her partner of 10 years. Originally from Illinois, and her partner from New Jersey, they have built their home in Missouri, where she is the owner and founder of Blissful Beginnings Doula Services, LLC. Together, they have eight children, including his three and her two from previous marriages, with their youngest three being the last ones in the home and homeschooled. As a mother, wife, teacher, daughter, advocate, and consultant to many, She keeps herself quite busy. Family urged her for years to become a life coach or an attorney since she was always advocating and consulting others on their life trials. But it wasn't until 2018, after having a tumultuous postpartum period, she realized life coaching and becoming an attorney was not her calling. She wanted to empower, advocate, and figure out what she could do to help others become more aware in their birthing experience. Janice reached out to a trusted mentor in the birth community locally, and she suggested she should take a community health worker certification program. Before completing the CHW program, it was evident the birth world was where she needed to be, and the rest is her story, so they say. Her educational background consists of an undergrad in criminal justice and a master's degree in business and leadership. These degrees helped to cultivate her business. Now in 2022, Janice has attended numerous seminars, webinars, classes, and trainings over the past few years to gain and pay forward all she has learned. She currently serves Missouri and Kansas as a certified Full Spectrum Wellness Doula, Child Passenger Safety Technician doing car seat events and complimentary inspections, Childbirth Educator teaching on safe sleep and maintaining a healthy home free from asthmatic triggers, food preparation and planning, sibling care while women labor, and volunteering as a program director with KC Women's Ministry as a birth and postpartum doula for marginalized women. Her numerous partnerships with everything mom and baby are still evolving, and her goal is to be a one-stop knowledge base for those who need childbirth guidance. That is amazing. Thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome. Welcome, 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 Janice. I am so glad that you could join us this evening and we could have this conversation. I don't have you long, so we're just going to jump right into the discussion. How? What were your messages around labor, childbirth, pregnancy uh, prior to becoming a mother and prior to be getting into uh, birth work? Um. Before being a mother, I, I would say I didn't have much and many impressions on birth. Um, I just knew that birth was about pain and then you have a baby. Um, there was certain episodes on television shows I would watch or movies and it always was circled around pain. My family didn't really talk about it much um, growing up. I didn't have anyone around me that I had to witness going through a whole nine months of pregnancy. Either once I saw like family members, they had their baby already, or they were maybe um, early on in their stages of pregnancy. So no one really sat around me. Um, and I grew up in the age too, where, you know, children didn't get involved in adult conversations. So, <laughs> so anything that's pregnancy, sex related, or anything like that, um, I wouldn't be privy to those conversations. So 
um, I didn't hear any um, horror stories of, you know, being pregnant is going to be really bad. Um, don't do it. Or my body is going through these changes. So I knew nothing about that. And I had decided early on, I didn't want to have kids. And so I felt like it's not a big deal for me to even think about what goes into pregnancy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So there's like so many things about that growing up in that same era of just not having that information on board. And it's interesting because everyone that I've spoken to, it, it seems rare, um, both the mothers and the father to have anything that was shared outside of possibly a sex ed class or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just the messaging from the shows and the movies that we were mm -hmm. going to around what it looked like. She was always on the bed and stirrups and you yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> on her back. Yes. All heavy and you know she's mad at everybody <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> it definitely wasn't portrayed as like this you know kind of sacred peaceful no. or you know blissful mm -hmm. uh yeah. as in you know blissful beginnings it wasn't kind of <laughs> portrayed in that way so i i appreciate yeah. just your sharing of that and, and the fact that you at some point wasn't really, you know, planning or foreseeing having children in the future. No, not at all. I was like, that's not my thing. So I was a tomboy too. Mm -hmm. And I just, again, that whole screaming and the whole, I, it, it just kind of resonated as very feminine, I guess, mm -hmm. to me. And um, I was like, I don't see myself like screaming and being like having a baby. Like, I just didn't see that as something that would be a part of my life. So I was like, yeah, no, I'm just going to take a hard pass on that. <laughs> <Gotcha>. <laughs> I'll babysit. <laughs> but then fast forward to when you find out that, you know, you're pregnant. How, what was that preparation like for you? What were the, were there childbirth classes? Were there people in your life that were kind of helping you to prepare? How did you make that transition into, okay, I'm pregnant. Now what? Um, actually, um, I did do, they did have childbirth classes that were offered that I took. Um, and at the time I was, um, just retired military. So, um, my husband was still military and we pretty much had decided like we were going to do a military hospital. Mm -hmm. So it, I mean, it was all in the plan. <laughs> it was all in the benefit package. Gotcha. So we didn't look outside of that. Um, we didn't know that there were things outside of that. So what they offered is what we took. And um, and then just my family, like the ancestors were like, this is how you take care of a baby. This is what you do while you're pregnant. This is what you don't do. Um, stick to that and you'll be OK. And I was like, OK, um, <laughs> I'm here, you know, and everyone else is here. So they know what they're talking about. Yeah. And um, again, because those conversations weren't had like, you know, this person may have torn or mm -hmm. this person may have had issues with their placenta, that kind of, those conversations never came up. And as you mentioned with sex education, actually, um, my parents were very, very strict when it came to um, things outside of the structure that we had at home. So they opted me out of sex education because they didn't feel that I was ready for that discussion. So I never even had that piece. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I had like basic biology, anatomy, but mm -hmm. no um, sex education. So um, it was just basically what I learned and what I studied along the way. Um, at that point, I had not been to college yet, just mm -hmm. to the military and, and no one in the military is talking about sex. Right. Um, <laughs> it is not talked about. Um, and so once I got um, everything together that they told me to get through my childbirth class. I just followed my list and got this and got that, had my baby shower. I just did like kind of the status quo of what it means to have your baby. I didn't think outside of that um, because again, I wasn't planning on having a baby. So I didn't have those um, dreams of like, I want to do this and I want to do that. And I want my birth to be like this because I didn't know those were options. Right. Um, I just <laughs> thought it was just the, the one way. And needless to say, the military hospital, um, like I had thought it was supposed to be, was very structured as military life is. Um, the doctors weren't overly friendly. The nurses weren't overly friendly. They were just medical personnel. Um, and so I didn't feel like I was being being treated bad, but I wasn't I wouldn't say I had this like warm and fuzzy feeling either about the, the facility. Um, and it was more like once I 
once I initially went into labor, um, we just hit, immediately went to the hospital. We didn't wait. We didn't try to stay home as long as possible. We just kind of threw our bag in the car and was like, let's get to the hospital. And I was like a week and a half overdue already. So once I got there, they sped everything up. Um, I do remember getting the epidural, which was the earlier stages of the epidural. And I had um, a very bad itching side effect to that, um, that they seemed like they didn't understand what was going on. And and it kind of felt like eczema a little bit. It was really inner. It was not outer. But um, that was probably the, the most torturous of the whole experience because I couldn't really get into anything else. Or like now I tell my clients, like, stay in your zone and focus in. I couldn't focus on anything but that itching. <laughs> and so <laughs> once I was, um, they were like, you're at your pushing stage. I was like, okay. Because I had the epidural, I couldn't really tell. And mm -hmm. I didn't feel like it was a big deal either because I figured, again, they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, once I had them, um, I didn't get the skin to skin. That was not an option. Um, they immediately take the baby over to, to the heating lamp, the little table, and they wash them up. And then they bundle them and bring them back to you. And I also had to share a room. They didn't have like single rooms unless you had like, a huge issue or like you had some kind of um, infection and you had to have a longer stay. So you shared a room and it had curtains pulled in between and um, you stayed your, your number of days. Someone may have popped in and checked on you for a little while. And then they offered at that time too, to keep the baby. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one thing though. I, I really was like, no, <laughs> I want my baby with me the whole time. Um, and that was kind of coming out of the age of where babies were getting like um, stolen and babies were getting confused and people were getting the wrong kid. So oh. like, yeah, coming off of that whole era of that. So I was kind of fearful of that. Mm -hmm. That was, and again, I got that from like news and television. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing that I knew of birth going in that I don't want nobody to steal my baby or them confuse my baby with someone else and give me a different baby back. Um, because again, you um, you hold your baby for a little bit and then they, you know, take your baby to do all of the other things they need to do. So it's not like now where you can bond and get to see the features and know your baby's face and know so I'm like <laughs> they bring me back a different baby. Well, I know. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was really quick. And then I'm still under the epidural and all this other medicine. And I'm just kind of like, no, keep my baby with me at all times. I'll be fine. And with my, my husband stayed um, a good majority of the time as well. But yeah, that that whole experience um, was, it was nothing <laughs> that I thought it was going to be, but it was all that I kind of thought it was going to be at the same time. Wow. So that's that's very interesting because like you're saying, it's a, it was like the typical status quo around what the expectation was for a hospital birth and kind of everything went as, you know, it, it's supposed to go in that regard. Yes. And, and then not having anything to contrast that too. So now you fast yes. forward to your next birth and that was also, the second birth was also in a hospital as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that one, I also um, did the epidural as well. Um, at that point, that was 2001. Mm -hmm. It was pretty much a standard. Like <laughs> you come in. Um, the intervention and, cycle. Yeah. That's the, yes. The intervention okay. cycle. And so they were like, you know, you come in. And I, again, I was um, I was overdue by, I think, a day. Mm -hmm. um, and so once you know, once you hit those hospital doors <laughs> and you're overdue, they're like, yeah, <laughs> the gate locks behind you. <laughs> or so it, it seemed, and now I know better. But at that point, it was like, ah, we can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and we might as well just go ahead and have the baby because I'm overdue anyway. And so it was kind of the same thing. Um, again, with that pregnancy, I felt like I, I did because it was a regular hospital at that point. Um, and I felt I had a little bit more autonomy with, with mm -hmm. that pregnancy. Um, and it wasn't like, you know, we're going to come in and give you directions. You're going to follow them kind of like, <laughs> like the correctional mm -hmm. facility or something like that, a uh, military hospital. Mm -hmm. It was more, um, a little more relaxed. The environment was a more comfortable. Um, it wasn't as, um, plain black and white environment. It mm -hmm. was, um, they had like a sofa and like, I was like, Ooh, so I was amazed. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, Oh, we have a couch in here. Dad can sleep on the. And so mm -hmm. it was, it, it was, um, 
the environment was a little bit more warming and inviting. And so I appreciated that. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it was that same medical staff um, deal, like, like say it was the intervention cycle and they just were in there for their one thing. And they were like, this is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to do. And, and is this okay? Um, I did know with that, with that pregnancy, um, that's when the first conversation of C-sections came up. Really? And I was like, oh, and they were like, well, if you, you know, if the baby doesn't start coming soon, we may have to do a C-section. Now, I wasn't aware of what a C-section was. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I was thinking, I thought that was in an emergency and this is not an emergency. So why are we discussing that? And they were like, we just want to let you know. And they gave me all the the uh, legal and the, the professional jargon about that. And I was like, well, that's not going to happen. Right. So I knew automatically, like, I'm not going to do that. So I don't know what I need to do or what I need to sign, but I won't be having a C-section because right. I don't feel like I'm in a, I was like, is the, you know, the baby fine? They were like, baby's fine for now. <laughs> but <laughs> if you don't have the baby soon, we just might have to go and deliver because, you know, the heart rate will drop and all that other stuff that they still do to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. to kind of I'm glad we're having this conversation because again, just, not knowing your options, not knowing mm-hmm. your your body in that way, and not having things on board, not having an advocate there for you. Yes, it's, yeah. it's this. It's it's like the cycle and this mm-hmm. continuous way of pushing women through that is not in our best interest, and, and is more so for the benefit of the medical establishment. Even yeah. the term like being past due, like the date that was given. Mm-hmm. Is the mm-hmm. You have no idea the divinely appointed time this being is going to come into the world. So are they late or are they on time? Are we just concerned yeah. <laughs> or like, you know, yes. so I, I, I truly appreciate you being able to take us through these various scenarios because you've experienced from one almost extreme to the other, right? Like we talk about traditional yeah. structural hospital mm-hmm. birth what it looks like to be in a home environment. So yes, let's please continue on with just how that progressed. <laughs> so um, so it was 12 years till I had my next child. Um, I had remarried, so the plan was not to have any more children. Um, I had determined to stop at like 35, I was like 35 no more. Um, <laughs> and then obviously um, my husband and myself found each other and he was like, I want kids. And I was like, well, uh, Okay, maybe we just keep going in. And <laughs> um, and so at that point, um, I had you know, I had been to college, I had um, you know, learned some things, um, and I was um in the criminal justice field. So I was like, you know, I know all the legal stuff now. So I felt a little bit more empowered, like they're just not gonna, you know, tell me what I can and can't do and put these restrictions down because I know what I can and can't do now um, Mm -hmm. to a degree. And so with my now eight year old, um, we did a hospital. um, And at that point we had moved here. Um, We were residing in North Carolina. So we had moved here and I just searched around for like the best birthing center that would get me closer to having, um, again, that autonomy that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, I won't mention names, but I did find a, a hospital that I ended up going with in Kansas. And so um, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. And I had got a, uh, gotten a prenatal doctor, um, but she was not on board <laughs> with my decisions. And so I realized that um, after a, a visit or two, we weren't agreeing on things. And it got to the point where I felt like we were arguing and she was like, we're not arguing. But I was like, we've gone back and forth on the same topic three times in this one office visit, that's an argument to me. And I don't want to argue with the person that's going to deliver my child. I would not feel comfortable with that. So Mm -hmm. around 36 weeks, I switched doctors. Mm -hmm. Um, And I had gotten um, a medical midwife at that point. And she was a little bit more flexible. But again, we had that same like um, inducing conversation um, because I did reach uh, 42 weeks. So Mm -hmm. We had that induction conversation and the possible um, the baby could die if I waited. And I was just like, that's why I got a midwife <laughs> to not have these conversations. Mm-hmm. They went forth with like setting an appointment for me to be induced. And and I mean, 
it was just kind of like, you know, we would like you to show up. And so my husband and I decided like, just because of the stress of all of it, we just were not going to answer our phone and talk to the doctor. I knew I was fine. I knew um, what was going on with my body and it was no point in me having to induce my pregnancy. And again, those due dates, I just didn't believe that I was off track with my due date. And I knew I was right with my cycle dates. But again, I was like, it, it, I just didn't believe that I was past past due as much as they had on record. Right. So um, I, I just went forth with waiting until my body started to to go through into contractions and to start the labor process on its own. And um, and I went to another hospital and asked them, you know, what it would look like if I came into their emergency room. And they basically told me, like, we can't turn you away. We can't turn people away at the emergency room. So if you come in and you're pregnant, we have to deliver the baby. And I was like, cool, because that's what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> I don't want to go to the hospital where my doctor is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and and I say doctor, but midwife. But to me, sometimes the ones in the hospital are one and the same. So mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I just say doctor. But I did eventually go through the ER and I, I just got the doctor that was on call and the experience was good. Um, I didn't have any problems with that one. Moving to my seven year old, uh, now seven year old, mm -hmm. I, I went to that same hospital, but this time I actually had um, a doctor from a practice that, that followed me along. Um, and I had also hired a doula with my eight year old. I forgot mm -hmm. to mention, I did hire a doula. And so she kind of gave me things I needed to look at and, what I wanted to decline and what I wanted to agree with. So um, that's when I kind of found out about um, just letting the cord pulsate and what the vitamin K was for and all these things that I thought were just standard that you really didn't need to decline or really look into. They just kind of gave you sheets. It's like immunizations. They just give you a sheet, an info sheet, but they're like, it's really good for you. So you should just go for it. That's and <laughs> kind of had that mind frame where with pregnancy, it was the same deal. Oh, it's got to be good for the baby. So I know you're giving me an information sheet. I'm going to look at it. But I'm going to agree because this is what Standard. I'm supposed to do. Right, right. Standard. And I don't want to buck the system for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, but when she gave me the information, I kind of looked at it. I was like, oh, yeah, like the hep B, we don't need that. You know, I mean, I kind of was able to do my own research and see the pros and cons from someone who was not in the medical profession mm -hmm. telling me this, because at that point, like I said, family wasn't, none of my family has that I know of um, has bucked the system. Yeah. And, and were saying to me, like I had an all natural holistic type. <laughs> no one told me that if they did, yeah. they didn't tell me. And so <laughs> I was thinking, well, everyone else in the family has done this and this is the way it goes. So I'm not going to, be difficult for no reason. Mm -hmm. And so once I had my seven year old, um, things went really crazy um, with my seven year old. I did not know about the um, the checks that um, if they check you too often or if they have you push too early, you can tear and, and, and things like that. And so everything that went wrong could possibly go wrong in that pregnancy um, with the doctor I had. And I was very, very disappointed in the whole experience. Mm -hmm. And to me, I was like, I went from one glorious experience with my now eight year old to that one. And I was like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. And I need to research more. And so um, between that child and my now three year old, um, I decided I was gonna do a home birth mm -hmm. and um, just avoid the hospital because it was so traumatizing that last birth that I did not want to send myself through that again unnecessarily. Yes. At that point with my fifth child, I'm like, I have this, I've got this. This is not nothing out under the sun that I don't know about. Um, I still had a doula, but I read some more books. I did um, more research. I looked into things um, as far as like finding your focal point and affirmations and just different things that I had not thought about in any of the other pregnancies as much because I had not seen how much the medical professional really pushes back when you make up your mind <laughs> to be free thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> I was really appalled at how um, women were being stressed out more so from the doctor, not environment, not home, but yes. the doctor is stressing them out more so because they won't do what they say. And right. 
I just cannot wrap my head around that. And um, so, yeah, it <laughs> um, with, with my last one in the home birth, I, I hired midwives. Um, unfortunately, I did end up doing a hospital transfer. Mm -hmm. um, and because um, it just, the pain was was really, really great for me. And everyone kept telling me, oh, it's your last one. She'll come so quick. And that, no. So about 15 hours in, <laughs> 15 hours in, I'm like, this is not quick. Um, I'm going to need something to help me get over this. Um, <laughs> take the edge off. Um, so I did do a hospital transfer. But the good thing thing was, um, as much as I didn't want to go, um, I was only there like three hours before I delivered. So, <laughs> so it worked out because all the doctor really had to do was like come in and and they did their little thing and they was like, okay, we're ready to push. And I was like, already so soon? Okay. And so, yeah. And, and my doula was there by my side and the midwives came to the hospital. Um, and they were not far. So it um, it was really good because the majority of my labor was done at home. Mm -hmm. I got to do all the things I wanted to do. I got to get in the water, get in the pool, get in all the things um, and do all the things I wanted to do for comfort mm -hmm. and not have someone over my shoulder saying, well, we can't do that here or you can't do that here. Or when are you going to have the baby? Is the baby, are you ready to push? Um, here's this this a la carte of drugs and medication. Mm -hmm. to help me. It just it felt good to not have that pressure um, because I realized for me, I thought the birthing world was going to get better from mm -hmm. where I started. And it actually got worse mm -hmm. to me, um, in my opinion, um, because it became a doctor's world. And it's like even now, you know, you're taboo or you're anti this or anti that if you're not in that box and going along with the system that they created. And slowly but surely people are finding out that everything isn't good for them or their bodies it may have worked out for like my mom my grandmother my cousin had no problem but for me like with the epidural i had the whole itching thing and everybody's like what no or you know for nausea they gave me um a medication that made my blood pressure spike i mean wow. it my body that is going to be affected, not the other person that says that they had the same stuff and they didn't, nothing happened to them. So um, it's just the individualisticness about it to me, if that's even a word, um, that yeah. I don't feel that the medical staff even um, thought about. And so I knew I had to take control and do my own thing. So <laughs> I truly, truly appreciate your story because I think, you know, too often there is always like these extremes, right? Either you, you know, you're you're pro the standard and that's just kind of how things are, or you're, you know, you're off to the left side and you're like, you know, everything natural. Da, 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 da. And my thing is, it really is about the mother's experience. So mm -hmm. if you if you came out of the experience and you're like, wow, that was amazing for me. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it is about. And, and that can happen in any of those scenarios. But were you comfortable? Did you feel heard? Did you feel safe? And sometimes mm -hmm. it takes different environments for people to come to that. So like yes. there's no right way to birth, but to be <laughs> to be informed and to know what your mm -hmm. options are and to be in a situation where, like you said, you feel heard because once you start asking questions and it's not just like, oh, this is good for you, sign off on it. And then, yeah. then you get the pushback, like, how dare you question me? Yes. Like, whose <laughs> body is this? Like, who, who's doing this? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I appreciate mm -hmm. that information. So, so I definitely want to get into what is Blissful Beginnings and what are the services that you provide? Um, so with Blissful Beginnings, it all started as postpartum doula um, business, as a postpartum doula business. Mm -hmm. And it kind of has evolved into a birth doula business. Um, I do meal prep and, and um, well, I can also prepare or I can just do like a meal card um, package for clients. So that has um, come, come about. Mm -hmm. I do sibling care. And then as time went on, I still wanted to learn more. So that's when I began doing um, childbirth education and decided to get certified in that. So I now provide childbirth education courses to clients who, who are in need of it, especially my first time moms. Um, and then now I'm working on um, 
doing other certifications as far as safe sleep. So mm -hmm. I've started doing that in cribs for kids and um, child seat, um, child seat inspections for some okay. clients. Cars. Okay. Okay. So the, the services have definitely be expanded. It seems like, you know, there's definitely a need for that sort of support. Um, has there been any significant changes pre-COVID to post-COVID or um, is that <clears throat> adding to the services that you provide? Do you find that there's a different need now? Um, <clears throat> the need has been more um, education-based, okay. um, I'd say. Pre-COVID, I still was kind of sticking to the basics of these are the um, top 10, <laughs> for example, things that you need to know going in the door. Now it's gone more to here is your legal stand for standpoint. And um, this is all the things that you need to have your informed consent on. Mm -hmm. um, just because there was so much going on with babies being separated from mamas because of COVID tests, um, fathers or partners not allowed in because of um, hospital policies or, or whatever, and doulas not coming in. So now it's more about um, you need to talk to the personnel ahead of time or this this particular staff person about your rights and um, you know what you can what you're going to be getting out of this experience and how are they facilitating that experience for you. So I think it's gotten more detailed and more specific now and and very legal in an aspect to know what your rights are as far as not just COVID, but as far as knowing what your rights are um, as birthing in COVID environments, wow. so to say. Now, that's powerful. And it sounds like that's a course in and of itself that could be done <laughs> virtually. Like what questions to ask and, and kind of where things are. And it seems to be ever changing with, you know, legislations and things of that nature. So um, is this something <clears throat> that we will find on your website? How do people get in touch with you if they want to know more information? So um, I do have a website. It's um, www.blissfuldoulaservices.com. Um, and that kind of gives an overview of the services I offer and the different um, other organizations that I have connections to or that I have some information about. And I also can be reached by phone. And that's 913-944-5280. And then I'm also um, a part of a nonprofit organization um, at KC Women's Ministry, where I do um, some program directing for them. And those are for women who need, um, who are in like a, a situation where if they're in a shelter and they need get doula services, um, I can provide for them through that um, nonprofit as well. Mm -hmm. And I can also be reached on Facebook Messenger um, at Blissful Doula Services and then by regular email at empowersolitude.com, which is on the website as well. Excellent, excellent, excellent. We will definitely have all of that information and in your links in the description so we can reach out to you directly. I truly appreciate this conversation and everything that you shared. I think it is extremely valuable. And please, if you found something valuable from this conversation, definitely share, share, share. There's a wealth of resources. So get in touch with Blissful Beginnings. Uh, and I truly appreciate your time, Janice. Thank you. And it's an honor being on here and I appreciate it as well. Peace and blessings, family.